Good evening, and thank you all for joining us for tonight's live briefing event. Today, we're thrilled to discuss the journey from the classroom to Congress with some great former educators. I'm Joel Wenger, the political director for Democratic Majority for Israel. On behalf of our entire staff, our president, Mark Melman, and our board and board co-chairs, Ann Lewis and Todd Richmond, welcome. We hope you and your loved ones are staying well and healthy during these times. We hope you will join us next Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern time for Building Back Better, Reshaping American Influence at Home and Abroad with Chairman Hakeem Jeffries, Congresswoman Chrissy Houlihan, Democratic Senate nominee, Jamie Harrison. Before I turn it over to Mark Melman to introduce our distinguished guests, I'm going to go over a few items. If you like what you're hearing today, please check us out on social media. We're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and you can sign up for our news and updates on our website, dmfi.org. We'll take questions during the session, and if you want to ask a question, submit it through the Q&A feature on your Zoom interface. If you're watching on Facebook Live and you want to submit a question, you can type it into the comments box. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Melman, President and CEO of Democratic Majority for Israel. Thanks very much, Joe. I appreciate it. Thank you all for joining us this evening. As Joe said, I am proud to serve as the President and CEO of Democratic Majority for Israel. And it's going to be my honor to uh, introduce our guests in just a moment. Uh, but before I do that, allow me to say a word or two about the MFI. Uh, Democratic Majority for Israel is committed to advancing the interests of the Democratic Party, advancing the positions and issues and agenda of the Democratic Party and to making sure that that Democratic Party that we love and support remain, remains a pro-Israel uh, party. Uh, we've undertaken those efforts in a wide variety of ways. Uh, we've been involved in, uh, in platform fights at the national level and at state levels. We've been involved in legislative battles. We've been involved in, in primary elections. We're now involved in general elections uh, across the country, helping uh, some of our pro-Israel champions, some of whom uh, you'll meet tonight. Uh, Obviously, one of the important things that we're trying to do is uh, help elect uh, our nominee, Joe Biden, who is uh, not only a, a wonderful human being and the person, uh, along with Kamala Harris, who is uh, able to uh, restore the soul of America. Uh, we also uh, want to uh, make sure that uh, we play a part in, in electing uh, those two individuals uh, as president and vice president uh, of the United States. Uh, to that end, uh, we have uh, uh, developed an ad, which we want to show you in a moment, uh, that is uh, on the air in uh, several swing states at the moment, uh, directed to pro-Israel voters. But just to give you an example of what we're up to, Hadar, if you wouldn't mind queuing up the ad. With all the change you will hear about, there is one enduring essential principle that will not change. And that is our commitment to the peace and security of the state of Israel. That is not negotiable. That is not a matter of change. That is something to be reinforced and made clear. DMF IPAC is responsible for the content of this advertising. So again, DMF IPAC is, uh, is airing that ad in, in several swing states at the moment, targeted uh, two pro-Israel voters trying to do our part with your support uh, to make sure that we elect uh, uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris. Uh, this was supposed to be a debate night. This was supposed to be a pre-debate program. Uh, as you know, there is no debate because uh, President Trump uh, pulled out ignominiously uh, from the debate. But we are going to have a, a really exciting discussion tonight uh, on uh, education issues as well as broader political issues uh, in this election. Uh, and beyond. And it's my pleasure to introduce our three distinguished guests. Uh, Dan Fian is the Democratic nominee to represent Minnesota's first district. Uh, following uh, four years of service in the military, Dan continued his service by becoming a teacher in, uh, in high needs communities, fought, uh, taught first grade for a year on Chicago's South Side, two more years in a middle school in Gary, Indiana. Uh, he's running for Congress to continue serving his country committed to working with others to enact policies that will improve the lives of Americans everywhere, and is also a strong pro-Israel champion. Carolyn Long, another pro-Israel champion, is a Democratic nominee running to represent Washington's third congressional district. Uh, she began uh, pursuing her career in higher education, putting herself through college by working at a local grocery store, where she was a UFCW union member, 
Uh, she worked at Washington State University in Vancouver for 25 years as a tenured professor, held administrative and leadership positions at the university, a Fulbright, Fulbright scholar who's won multiple awards for her work, uh, including the Iris uh, H. Rock Award, uh, which honors women in the Southwest Washington who promoted civil discourse, teamwork, collaboration, uh, and cooperation. And those are values that she will uh, continue to uh, carry on uh, when she joins the United States Congress. Uh, and last but not least, uh, we have Congressman Boyle, who is already a member of Congress uh, and has uh, uh, been a extraordinarily strong pro-Israel champion uh, and somebody that is really on the, on the right side of so many issues uh, the, uh, for the Democratic Party, the son of immigrants. He was the first in his family to attend college. Uh, in addition to uh, serving in the Pennsylvania House of Representatives, he taught as an adjunct professor at Drexel for three years before running for Congress. He's the founder and chair of the Congress for Congressional First Generation Student Caucus, as well as the uh, Public Service Loan Forgiveness Caucus. Uh, Congressman Boyle has been a champion for issues that affect students, middle and working class families across America. He sits on the House Budget Committee and the House Ways and Means Committee, two vitally important committees where he's able to make a critical contribution for our country, for our party, and most of all, for his constituents. So again, to our panelists, thank you very much for being with us. Let me turn it back to Joel, who'll be guiding tonight's discussion. Thank you so much, Mark. Uh, really appreciate it. Congressman Boyer will be with us in just a moment. He's having, um, as, as we've all suffered over these past times, some Zoom difficulties. So I hope we can all understand that. So I want to start off, you know, while tonight's conversation is going to be about education, um, obviously there are two town halls happening tonight. And despite us not having this, the debate, there will be these two competing town halls. Um, and my question for you guys is, what do you hope to hear um, from Vice President Biden tonight during his town hall uh, down in... Go ahead. We'll go to you first, uh, Dan. Start with you. Well, again, uh, thank you uh, to everyone for attending tonight. Uh, thanks to DMFI for your support, uh, for being there for a campaign like mine uh, and like Carolyn's as well to, to help expand the Democratic majority in the House. Um, honored to be here. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm uh, listening for a couple of things. Uh, Southern Minnesotans, who I am seeking to represent, I am here. Uh, in Mankato, Minnesota, the home of the Mayo Clinic here is in the district in Rochester, a lot of farmland uh, of farmers who have been really taking the brunt in the, over the last couple of years. And where COVID, of course, like everywhere, is having a huge impact. People are going through a really hard time right now. Uh, they are exhausted. Uh, they are sick and tired of chaos. And they are desperately, desperately seeking leadership. Uh, they are desperately seeking a national strategy to defeat COVID for one, but for every other impact of life that was there to begin with that has been magnified uh, in the last nine months, they're, they're looking uh, for relief. They're looking for an end to it. Uh, they're looking for empathy. You know, I think there's a, a significant way in which President Trump has created and sown chaos uh, in, in so many different forms. That chaos is loud. It tends to be noisy and it tends to, to fill the room at times. But I truly believe that empathy uh, is a much more powerful force. It might not be as loud, uh, but it is, it is there for people who are looking for it. And so I hope to see that out of Vice President Biden again tonight whether direct to camera, uh, as, as he did so many times, or frankly, in the form of a, a town hall, a chance to really connect with people. Because I, I imagine every single story you hear isn't just a story, it's someone's life that represents thousands, if not millions of lives who are in a similar position right now. And that empathy is what they need to hear right now. They need to hear empathy that also is a call for leadership and, and change that desperately needs to come and that will motivate them to not just vote, but be, realize their vote matters. And, and that's what I hope to hear too, a call to the people who, who are cynical and believe that they don't need to vote at all. Um, that, that is where and how we went by motivating people with empathy, with that powerful call for leadership to get up and vote and have their voice be heard. Awesome. Carolyn, we'll go to you. Yeah, well, first of all, thank you to DMFI uh, for, for hosting this event and having us and, and uh, Joel and, and Mark for the work that you do. Um, you know, my philosophy is very similar to Dan um, in terms of wanting to uh, hear Biden be the, the vice president, be the leader that he is. And one of the things that's impressed me so much um, in the last uh, several months is his uh, focus on sort of bringing the country together and unifying the country around uh, shared values. And I think he hits really the right tone when he does that because we are so politically polarized and there is such incivility in our public discourse. And I think he provides um, just a vision for what real leadership looks like and what we want it to look like after a particularly fractious time in, in our politics. Um, and I think the direction, you know, um, uh, like uh, Dan, many people in my district are 
uh, really concerned about uh, the state of our attention to coronavirus and the economic recovery. They're quite disappointed in leadership from this administration and, and frankly, in, in Congress's inability to, to get a package through um, because of the stalling um, uh, effects that are happening with uh, Mitch McConnell's Senate. So I think providing a path forward that is optimistic uh, and that shows that we can heal uh, these fractions that we have in our society is really what um, I'm looking for and what I think the American people are looking for. Uh, and I'll end by just saying that in the first debate, we saw a real clear contrast in terms of style, uh, mm -hmm. which uh, our leader will bring to the White House, and we need that. And the times when he spoke directly to the camera about what he can do for America really touched me, and I know touched a lot of Americans. And I'm, I'm looking for a repeat of that when he speaks to uh, folks in the town hall tonight. Awesome. Thank you. Congressman Boyle, thank you for joining us. To, to repeat the question that, that we're addressing right now, um, you know, Vice President Biden will be doing a town hall tonight, and we asked the, the other panelists what they're hoping to hear from him um, during tonight's town hall event that he's doing. Oh, no. I think we're having some audio issues. Let's see, Congressman Boyle, we're having trouble hearing you right now. Um, we'll come back to you in a second. Um, so we'll come back and, and we'll hopefully we can get this resolved. Uh, Adar will work with your team on this real quick, hopefully. Um, you know, we'll go to you next, Dan. Uh, Dan, we know that you served as, as an active duty soldier for four years, as Mark mentioned, and continued on to serve your community as a teacher in underserved communities. You know, what lessons inspired you to run for Congress and how did they develop through your time in the military and as a teacher? It's, uh, it's uh, I think no matter what your experiences in life, they, they need to be ones in which you gain some wisdom from uh, because it's going to apply no matter what you do next. And I have felt that way given the chance to serve in the military, serve as a teacher, and also uh, serve as a, an acting assistant secretary of defense in the in the Pentagon under under President Obama too. I mean, these experiences have, have had incredible influence on me. Um, one, as a soldier, uh, it is this, it, this ability to, no matter how challenging a situation is, to get things done, uh, to have a good outcome come out of it. And that was being in Iraq uh, with a platoon of about 24 soldiers searching for roadside bombs together. Uh, no more diverse uh, a group, uh, more diverse in the country itself, but you know, very few things we agreed on, but we, we found roadside bombs together. And that, I think, is, is, is telling of me to, when I look towards Congress, Hello? To yeah, see it. Um, Boyle, yeah, sorry. Yeah, we, we, we can hear you now. <laughs> sorry, I, I don't want to interrupt the, the person who's responding. I, I can wait. I, I'm just glad you can, uh, we can finally, we're finally connected. I could hear you guys, but it sounds like you couldn't hear me. So my apologies. No, no problem. Yeah, we, we, we'll just let Dan finish up. And then my next question will be for you. So don't worry. I'll come right back to you. Sounds okay. good. Awesome. Sounds good. So serving in the military is, is this idea like any form of public service. There's not a second option. You have to get things done. You have to accomplish something. And that, that drives me forward every single day because politics shouldn't be any different. There shouldn't be an option to disagree and go home. There shouldn't. Um, as a teacher, you know, I, I think being a teacher is a daily exercise in the test of your curiosity and your, your empathy. Because every student that's in front of you, if you don't approach them with curiosity with empathy, then you're going to fail that student in some way, shape, or form. And, I, and I, I view campaigning in much the same light. I have curiosity. I have empathy. I have interest for the context in which I, the voter in front of me is coming to the conversation. Because generally, this is a, a swing district. They don't see themselves as red or blue. They don't see themselves in a political light that politics tries to paint people. But they have a context that in this district, where I'm rep trying to represent, uh, we have voted for George W. Bush twice, Barack Obama twice, and President Trump. In this district, we voted for Jesse Ventura as governor of Minnesota back then. We, we are independent minded here. If you don't approach people with that context of, of being open to what their context is, uh, that's, that's a lesson I learned as a teacher in the same way I would have approached a, a student in the same way. And these are really helpful instructions because uh, the very first time, I'll, I'll end with this, the very first time I was briefing a subcommittee of Congress, the House Arms, uh, Armed Services Committee Subcommittee on Readiness. I was really excited for it and I was getting ready, getting ready, and I realized I was lesson planning. I, I was lesson planning for middle schoolers, and that's not to insult Congressman Boyle or, or maybe myself and, and Carolyn here in a minute, but it's the idea that the skill sets you learn as a teacher in particular allow you to be able to better communicate with such widely different groups of people, and that's something I'm glad to have had the experience to do. Awesome, definitely. Uh, Representative Boyle, 
you know, as most folks you know, you were a first generation student in both college and graduate school. Before you ran for Congress, you taught as a professor at Drexel University. Now, how did this, those experiences help to solidify your decision to run for Congress? And I assume you can still hear me okay, right? We got you, Congressman, yeah. Yeah, sorry about that. It's the, uh, the nature of, of this year. I, I zoomed in, I could see you guys, but uh, for some reason the audio wasn't working, so I'm, I'm glad we're able to connect. Um, you know, it's an, inter it's an interesting question. I, I think like the previous speaker, that skill set is enormously helpful um, because one of the most important things about being a representative is before you can represent people, you need to show that you are listening to them and that you are understanding them as best as you can. Uh, and that's something that, you know, you clearly see as a necessary skill set in the classroom. Um, so I, I think it's enormously transferable. I would also say that the ability to um, really listen to good questions and turn around in a fairly short, concise way and express rather complex, nuanced ideas in bite-sized portions. And that's not easy. Um, it's certainly easy to do the reverse, to take a simple idea and <laughs> go on and on about it. The opposite is quite challenging, to, to take something that, that is quite complex and boil it down in an easily digestible and, and understandable way. So I, I think that um, this is an area in which you know, all of us attempt to strive to get, get, uh, to get better. But if you don't at least have that skill set, you're probably not going to do well in either the classroom or in this profession. Definitely. And Carolyn, we'll go to you next. You know, as, as someone who worked at Washington State University for over 25 years, both administrative roles and as a professor, you know, what in your time at, at WSU motivated you to run for Congress? Excuse me one second. We have to make sure you're unmuted real quick. Unmute. Brendan go. coming now. Now it's affecting me. It's catching. So that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so uh, what I was saying is I never expected to run for Congress. The last uh, uh, race I ran for was student body president when I was in high school. And I actually was enjoying uh, the work that I've done at the university for a quarter of a century, teaching students about civic engagement, about the Constitution, about political institutions. Um, so I was actually motivated to run because I saw our country heading in the wrong direction. And um, for the first time, I was unable to fully explain why 2016 happened. And so after really studying um, uh, what led to, I think, the election of Donald Trump, after thinking a lot about what we needed to do to fix our political institutions to serve the people, I decided it was time to put theory into practice and to actually take what I had learned um, as a as a scholar of politics into running for politics. Um, I don't know if it does prepare you. I don't think anything quite prepares you for an actual run for Congress. Uh, but I do think that when you spend time talking to students about uh, politics, about policy, you learn how to communicate with them effectively, as the Congressman mentioned. Uh, but you also hear from them about what they think is wrong with the system. And so it gives you more reason to, to try to fix it. And so I actually am quite excited in um, how I'm talking about uh, addressing some of these institutional problems that are affecting us having a functioning democracy. And, and so that actually has motivated me in retrospect to run. You know, when you're teaching a class on Congress and you point out what you think is wrong with the system or you teach a class on the presidency and you find out where this president has gone in the wrong direction, that gives you a pathway to talking about these issues with people. But uh, I'm really excited to have had an opportunity to do this. Uh, and again, not something I ever thought I would do. I will say there, there are some disadvantages and I'm wondering if, if Dan and Brendan have faced this, but as an academic, when somebody asks me a question, I answer the question. It's, it's something I think is respectful. It's what uh, people want to hear. And so uh, it actually works against you a little bit because when somebody does that, you know, I want to answer questions. And sometimes that's not always politically the best thing to do. So uh, sometimes there's a tight walk there. But I do think that um, I'm my own sort of political being and, and people have gotten just accustomed to having me answer questions. So I'm not sure if that's good or bad, but it certainly is a challenge. Definitely, definitely. I think we definitely didn't see a lot of question answering during the last vice presidential debate. So, so 
you know, we'll go to the next question. An alarming number of students uh, don't know anything about the Holocaust. Recently, a principal in Palm Beach County was rehired despite refusing to say that the Holocaust was a historic factual event. And in California, Governor, Governor Newsom just vetoed a uh, mandated ethnic studies curriculum after it was criticized by Jewish groups for not being inclusive of their experiences. You know, how do we ensure that our students' curriculum have the right balance without bias? Um, and let's start with, with you, uh, Carolyn, for this one. Yeah, that's a tough question. You know, I think that um, one of the things that we have to make sure that we teach uh, students, uh, not just in college, obviously, but K-12, is the importance of critical thinking and how that they can critically assess information and where information is coming from. And that's because there's so much out there uh, that it's very difficult for people to know what is or is not uh, a valid piece of information. And I think, unfortunately, some political leaders, especially this administration, is sowing a lot of seeds of uh, distrust in things that people hear. So I think the first thing we have to do is make sure students are equipped with the ability to, to, to make sure that they know what is or is not accurate by finding out how to source material um, and then how to, to question it effectively. Uh, trying to find the right balance is difficult because those are inevitably political questions. Um, but I think that having an appreciation of history is what gets us through this. And I think that the examples, Joel, that you provide show that uh, the absence of that understanding of history um, makes it difficult to even start the conversation about what that right balance is. And unfortunately, uh, and I would d defer to, to Dan uh, and, and Representative Boyle about this, in K-12, uh, history and social sciences are uh, on the back burner um, uh, because of an emphasis on, on STEM classes, which I'm not opposed to, but I think we really have to, to bring that back into the classroom as, as a first order, have the skills that they should always be learning as a second, and then tackling those difficult questions about what that balance is. Definitely, definitely. Congressman Boyle, over to you next. Yes, can you hear me? Yep, we got you. Okay, good. Um, yeah, I, so this is such an important uh, question, especially in light of the recent polling data that you may or may have not seen a, a few weeks ago showing a shockingly high number of, of people that were just completely unaware uh, of the Holocaust. Um, I have to say this was not a, a big surprise to me um, because this is an area that I've been involved in since before I was in elective office. Um, I served on the board of a local Holocaust awareness museum that's actually a, a quite a unique museum because it's made up of artifacts and personal belongings to many of the Holocaust survivors and families that populated, that moved to Northeast Philadelphia and the adjacent Philadelphia suburbs uh, where I'm from. So once I did, then did become an elected official, first as a state legislator, I actually introduced the bill to mandate Holocaust and genocide education in our uh, Pennsylvania public school curriculum. And I'm proud to say that bill passed. So ever since 2014, um, learning about the Holocaust has been part of the curriculum here in Pennsylvania. I believe we're one of only now eight states that have that, that sort of mandate. So I think it is incredibly important. I would like to see all 50 states and it becomes especially important in the years ahead because I just think of the, the survivors who I've become friends with and have known over the last 20 years. Unfortunately, there are a number who are no longer with us uh, now who were involved 15 years ago just because they were in their 80s, 90s, even close to 100 and, and passed away. Um, the generation that is still alive now were children during the Shoah. And in, you know, 10 or 20 years, we will lose them and we will lose that last living link. So I, I think it's more vital now than ever that we ensure Holocaust education as part of our curriculum, because God knows there is a concerted denialism effort out there um, that is orchestrated and that I, I do fear will continue to grow uh, over time. Awesome. Dan? Dan? I think just to add to in looking at both both points, excellent points made already is, you know, we are we are uh, an entire generation plus now into the internet, 
and still not roundly embracing uh, an ability for critical thinking uh, from elementary school onward. And that, that is something as, as a former teacher that I want very much uh, to be included in the type of federal re research we put forward to help students to do just that. Um, because that's, that's one side of it. And we have entire generations of adults who just have been given the internet and literally no formal education behind it. And whether it's the Holocaust or so many other issues that you see so actively um, uh, questioned without any ability to discern and, and get to ground truth, it, it has an enormously uh, damaging effect on our politics on COVID, for example, just thinking of it that way. Um, and when I think of, uh, to Congressman Boyle's point on the, the idea of curriculum, it is, also, it is incredible and important to support co uh, candidates at the federal level uh, who, su who support not just uh, the nation of Israel, but the, the teachings and the history that, that comes uh, just as importantly with it. But at the state level and local level where decisions of curriculum are being made, um, that, that knowledge and influence uh, has to go, come there as well. And that can take the form of politics in a different form, but the advocacy has to come there because that's ultimately where decisions are made. I, I am talking to you from Mankato, Minnesota, where uh, the largest uh, mass execution in American history took place uh, during the War of 1862, a war that most people don't know about. It's a, a war against uh, the Dakota Native Americans uh, that were here on the prairie. Um, 38 Dakota men were, were hung here in Mankato. That's not roundly taught still in our public schools. Reconciliation, true form of reconciliation comes through the teaching of history. And when that, that history is forgotten, then reconciliation is truly never achieved. And, and so I am someone who very much wants to continue to advocate for that, but it can't just be at the federal level. It has to be at, frankly, every level of government that it's advocated for to, to ensure history is passed on. Definitely, thank you, Dan. Uh, you know, you kind of took, took the win, but I'll, I'll go ahead and we'll go to this next question anyway, even though you kind of started to answer it there. Um, you know. You know firsthand as educators how important it is to present students with factual information you know, and the accurate history that occurred. In a world where misinformation is increasingly shared online, you know, what role do educators play in ensuring our students are able to think critically about the information they're presented and weed out those facts from fiction? Dan, since you started to kind of answer that previously, I'll, I'll go to you first with this one. I, certainly. I mean, speaking as someone who, as, as a millennial, for example, being actively told to not use the internet when learning to write research papers growing up. I mean, that's, that's an entire generation of adults that that was the guidance given. You, any adults, any older, it's, you're getting even less than that. So to think of that impact. And it is unfortunately that older generations of Americans have even a tougher time of truth discerning when it comes to the internet, when it comes to political information put in front of them, that there are then American media enterprises that, that take advantage of this dynamic. And then further stories that are conspiracy theory based that are not based in facts and are able to prey on someone's, someone's willingness to believe anything because that's what's being undermined with it. Um, how you underdo, <laughs> under, undertake this begins with the formal education of teachers, ensuring that teachers are able to best incorporate the best practices. Because what's, what's important about education is that we have got 50 different states who approach it differently, but at the end of the day, there's a fifth grade classroom in Washington, there's a fifth grade classroom in Pennsylvania, there's one in Minnesota in which a teacher is on the precipice of teaching writing in which students are trying to fundamentally understand how to research things. Are those, are each one of those classrooms I'm talking about given, being given the best practices through research that ultimately lead to a student being able to discern truth? I would argue right now that in every one of the, our three classrooms that teachers figuring it out largely on their own. This is again where the federal government's research arm when it comes to education can provide the best frontline practices that every one of these teachers isn't figuring this out, isn't inventing a wheel, but we are figuring out not just the best way to do it, but applying it broadly so that every classroom is formalizing that form of education so that the generation of adults, the young people right now, may be the most responsible ones to determine the truth and they can lead the way for the rest of us who happen to be a little bit older. All right, uh, Representative Boyle, we'll go to you next with this question. Yeah, I, so I have to say, I, while I'm an optimist by nature, uh, I'm quite uh, concerned in, in the near term when it comes to this question. Um, I, I know that as Americans, uh, we obviously uh, have a strong appreciation for freedom of speech. It is, of course, enshrined as part of our First Amendment. And so anytime there's talk of policing speech, it's natural that we might, uh, you know, our first instinct might, might be to resist that. Um, that said, though, 
as we have seen the proliferation of quote unquote fake news, and I don't mean fake news in the sense the president used the term, I mean the actual definition of, of the term as it was originally invented to describe those who are creating and uh, perpetuating stories that appear to be from real news sources, but in fact are propaganda. Given the fact that they proliferate on uh, various platforms, especially Facebook, I do believe we need much more strict um, regulation in this area. It would be ideal if the platforms themselves were uh, able to police themselves better. Um, Twitter, in my view, probably at the moment is doing a little bit better job than that, than, than Mr. Zuckerberg at Facebook. Um, but I have to say, I think there needs to be stronger regulation uh, in this area. Uh, you know, if you think about, and I'm not that old, I, I'm 43, but for all of my upbringing, um, there was essentially three major TV networks, ABC, NBC, CBS. Uh, Walter Cronkite was, was still actually doing the news. He gave away eventually to Dan Rather. There was Peter Jennings and Tom Brokaw. Um, most people got their news from one of those three sources. Um, a little bit later, CNN and the other two cable uh, news networks came about, but that really didn't um, you know, take hold until the 1990s. So if you were in the 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, you were getting your news from three major TV stations or the paper of record in your metro area or town. Today, people are able to self-select their news. They're able to go to websites that reinforce their preconceived notions, listen to radio shows that reinforce their preconceived notions, and go to websites that reinforce their preconceived notions. Uh, how we combat that and get people at least on the same basic fact sheet, I think will be one of the generational challenges that we face for those of us who are in government, but also for all of us in society. Definitely, thank you, Representative. Carolyn? I'm gonna take this in a little bit of a different direction. You know, I, I, de I definitely agree with what Dan has said about what we teach in the schools in terms of critical thinking, scientific numeracy, all of those things that will, give people the skills to be able to try to delineate fact from fiction. Um, but I found in the work that I've done, which is connected to the deliberate democracy movement and an initiative I started, which deals with public deliberation, that it's really difficult in a highly polarized environment that we're living in uh, to have fact wars, because what's going to happen is people will say, this is what my fact is. And somebody will say, well, this is mine. Somebody will give a study. Somebody will give their counter study. And there's really no conversation that ends up taking place between people because they have these alternative perspectives. And as Representative Doyle said, that people are living in echo chambers online in their groups of people that they, uh, that they uh, um, uh, are friends with, even in their own neighborhood. So the question is, accepting the fact that this is the environment that we're living in, you know, what is a way that we can move forward to encourage a shared understanding uh, of just basic values and beliefs and just ways to have conversations. Because when you have the fact wars, people stop listening to one another. It's just completely unproductive. Um, and so what I teach my students and what I teach in my initiative is the importance of listening that's come up in this conversation. And when you hear someone saying something which is blatantly untrue, like the Holocaust never occurred, you know, Google, Google searches will show that that comes up for some of the first searches. Um, we find that if you ask questions like help me understand why you're saying this or uh, could you tell me uh, tell me more about why you think uh, climate change isn't real and you allow somebody an opportunity to talk about an issue uh, that listening displays the empathy that, that Dan was talking about earlier but you're also not getting into that battle of wills that is just so common today um, and then after that, I think uh, what we should do is what I teach my students and what we do in our community, which is we focus on shared values and beliefs uh, that we have, and then we work our way out. Because once you have a, a, a common understanding that we all agree that security is important, but liberty is also important, what we disagree with is how we balance those values, then at least you're talking to one another. So I think we have to have those conversations first uh, and have them be constructive um, rather than trying to fix every error, because as this administration has shown, you can't do it. And you can have somebody who has lied 20,000 times to the American people, and people will still believe them. So do you throw your hands up in the air, 
or do you sort of work with what you have and, and what you can refine, which are the skills that Dan talked about, including listening, and then sort of approaching things in a very different way and how you have political conversations. Definitely, thank you, Carolyn. So one of the, you know, obviously, uh, one of the biggest issues facing education these days is, is the COVID-19 pandemic as it's facing our society in many ways, including us being here remotely all today. Um, so how do you think we, how do you think we should balance the need to have students in classrooms to learn and the need to protect them, their families, the faculty and staff while reducing the spread of coronavirus? Uh, Congressman Boyle, we'll start with you here. Well, I, I, um, I was kind of uh, laughing when you were asking this question because um, I am the husband of an elementary school teacher and the father of a six-year-old who is in first grade. Um, so I, I feel like I should turn the phone over to my wife who would probably be better able to uh, answer this question. What we have come to the conclusion now that we're about, let's see, ever since about mid-March, from mid-March to uh, the end of June, our school was all virtual, both where my wife teaches and, and where my daughter attends. And then it has been the same since the beginning of the new school year uh, in September. And I have to say, uh, there are no good options right now. So if anyone has a magic bullet or the solution, any of my, I hope, future colleagues, uh, we would be all ears because this has been... Um, an enormously challenging time, I think, for so many American families. I know certainly for our own. Uh, the good news is, you know, thank God, uh, both my, my wife and daughter uh, had been safe, uh, certainly um, going in an all virtual um, realm does provide, you know, the best uh, protection from the virus. But in terms of the sort of, you know, educational value that my wife as an elementary school teacher is, is able to convey to her second grade students or that my daughter is receiving um, doing first grade on her laptop, you know, I, I have real questions about just um, to what extent, say for my daughter, that she might be behind where another typical first grader would be who is learning the traditional way in, in person. So on this, I have to say, um, I certainly do not feel like I have the answer. I think that everyone is struggling through this and it's sort of choosing the least bad option until we finally get a vaccine and get enough of the population vaccinated. Carolyn, we'll go to you next. Do you, do you have additional thoughts or? or kind of Only never realized until uh, uh, COVID how easy it was teaching college. I have a 15 year old and I've become a 10th grade teacher and I'm terrible at it. I can't imagine Congressman Boyle and his wife, uh, you know, having to do that both uh, his wife as a profession and then teaching a 10 year old. It's just, it is really difficult. I think we have to uh, just uh, uh, address it with empathy and uh, be there to assist, hope that it's short term. And uh, frankly, one thing that we have to do in Southwest Washington is uh, invest more in broadband internet because mm -hmm. it is needed now more than ever. It's why I'm in favor of broadband for all. I just, I'm hoping that it's short term, as the Congressman said, and that we uh, can be good partners um, with our teachers and helping our kids learn. Um, I do think that there's a difference in families and your ability to do so. And so we are going to see a furthering gap in, in educational uh, success. Uh, and that troubles me quite a bit. Definitely. Dan, how good of a job do you think we're doing at striking this balance by your criteria? So uh, the the criteria I evaluate this with is uh, like, like Congressman Boyle as a, as a parent first and foremost, of a fifth grader, first grader, and a 11 month old uh, who has never gone to daycare yet uh, because daycare was supposed to start in April and that just never happened. So we've just kind of figured it out. Um, I evaluate it secondly as a former teacher, uh, trying to, to look and see how literally the, the biggest buck that's ever been passed by a federal government has been passed on to them. I mean, that's, that's how I view things now. And thirdly, I look at this as someone who, when I was in the Defense Department, I was in the, the first American contingent from the Defense Department to go to Monrovia, Liberia, uh, to attempt to prevent the Ebola virus from becoming a global pandemic um, and try to think of the lessons we learned then in terms of the role the federal government is supposed to play, in terms of the administration role that is supposed to play as leader, as one that not just 
creates resources but distributes those resources to everywhere they need to go. Uh, that, that response from the federal level, which is where the buck stops, has been an abject failure, an abject failure. Mm -hmm. They have given up in every way, shape or form to have a national strategy for what is a national problem. So it doesn't matter what happens here in North Mankato, Minnesota for an elementary school, they, they cannot solve COVID-19. That teacher in, that teaches my fifth grader cannot solve COVID-19. The federal government is the one that can bring the resources to bear. Uh, this administration has shown no interest in, in developing that national strategy, but I truly believe knowing the people that will be part of a Biden administration, that they bring the wisdom and experience of having been through things like this before, and they would bring that to bear through things like the Defense Production Act, so that the fifth grade classroom here has the same access to tests that uh, in the National Basketball Association appears to have, rapid tests that would allow for testing that's instant, testing instant, which allows you to focus on tracing, and then adequate PPE for everyone that needs it, and not just hospitals and clinics, but everyone who's on the front lines. All of these things have been an abject failure, and we will continue to fail our teachers, our students, our school leaders, our parents, until that national strategy comes. And in the meantime, as Carolyn has pointed out, the, the loss in educational equity terms is catastrophic right now. Because I, I absolutely believe that the stunting of academic growth right now, we will be able to see and trace for the rest of this generation of children's lifetimes. And we have to work very hard to catch them up where again, there can be a federal role for research that we can figure out how best a fifth grader, a first grader, a kindergartner is gonna best catch up. And if you don't have the broadband internet to be able to deliver that education in the first place, it's gonna be a failure. It is a time that we need leadership on this. And I, I cannot accept, I, I had my 10 year old this morning told me how much, how sad he is. And a 10 year old doesn't know how to articulate how sad they are, but the loss that he has felt from, he can feel that this is not how his childhood is supposed to be. And that's what motivates the hell out of me every single day to deliver something better. Definitely. Well, Dan, we're gonna go to our, our last question of the evening now, so we can let folks have some time to get ready for the, for the town hall. Uh, and you rightly started to bring up President Trump during your answer there. You know, and President Trump is clearly making an effort to undermine confidence in this election and suppress the vote for his own purposes. You know, are you seeing any echoes of that from Republicans in your home area, Dan? Start with you. Uh, we've seen people try uh, in the form of a really scary uh, story last week in which a company is actively recruiting uh, former Special Forces uh, service members to come and essentially physically intimidate in polling locations in Minnesota, uh, which would be illegal here. Uh, thankfully, that was, was snuffed out. And the idea that we are trying at every level of law enforcement to look out for things like that, we're, we're on the watch for it. Um, we have a really great voting system here um, in which you have a no excuse absentee ballot that you could have requested at this point. Today was the, actually the last day you could have requested that. You can vote early at any polling location uh, that your county has and you can vote on election day too. Um, and we are doing everything we can to promote the idea that you have a safe and secure way to vote. Um, Minnesota has one of the best, uh, best protected uh, voting systems from a cyber security perspective um, and a strong tradition of people demonstrating their ability to vote. Um, but we're gonna keep watch on that because those efforts are, do not go unnoticed um, when it comes along the way. The, the undermining of democracy is the undermining of the right to vote. And this should be absolutely remembered um, going into the next session of Congress for how we strengthen the right to vote uh, because your ability to vote in Minnesota should look, look no different uh, in any other state uh, around the country. Definitely. Representative Boyle, or are you next? What are you seeing in your district? Yeah, well, of course I uh, am from Philadelphia and represent a part of Philadelphia literally the only city that in the presidential debate, the president of the United States went out of his way to attack saying, quote unquote, bad things happen in Philadelphia. Um, so it, it is unfortunately something uh, that this president and his campaign have been putting out there constantly. The idea that there's voter fraud in Philadelphia, it's not surprising that he would target us uh, first, I mean, Pennsylvania is perhaps the most critical battleground state, um, certainly one of the most critical. And Philadelphia is, of course, by far our state's biggest city and is overwhelmingly about 80-20 uh, Democratic. So it's not surprising that, that he would point to Philadelphia to attempt to make these allegations. Now, I am heartened by the fact that one of our city commissioners, the city commissioners oversee administration of elections in Philadelphia. One of them is a Republican named Al Schmidt, and you may have seen him on 60 Minutes or in, in other um, national TV shows. 
he's been um, incredibly responsible, uh, exposing the, the lies of what Donald Trump is saying, pointing out, as I have, that we have expanded vote by mail in our state because it was a Republican-led effort in the state legislature. They pushed for that last year before Donald Trump started uh, demonizing vote by mail. Um, the instances of actual demonstrated voter fraud are almost non-existent, both statewide and, and nationwide. And that is something that Commissioner Schmidt has also gone to great pains to, to point out. Now, last point I'll make on this that does uh, concern me. Um, given that the experience of vote by mail in our state is very new, it took a long time in our primary to count all the ballots. It is expected that it will take the better part of a week in Philadelphia and our populous suburban counties to vote to count all of the vote by mail ballots. So the the likelihood is that even if Joe Biden is ultimately winning our state by five, six points when all the votes are cast on election night, when 100 percent of the election day votes on machine are in, yet only a fraction of the votes by mail are counted. It is very likely that Donald Trump will be uh, that when you turn on TV and you look at what the networks are reporting out of Pennsylvania at 10, 11 o'clock at night, you might see Donald Trump in the lead. And the idea that the president of the United States would then use that to attempt to falsely claim victory. And then in the subsequent days, once he drops behind, claim falsely about voter fraud, uh, that is something that literally keeps me up at night. Definitely. Thank, thank you, Representative. Uh, Carolyn, we'll go to you. Yeah, just three qu quick points. You know, number one, we are so lucky in Washington State to have a history of safe, secure voting or exclusively vote by mail. We have been for over 10 years. We're predicting 82 to 85 percent uh, participation in the election. We now have same day registration and we have automatic voter registration. So we are truly a model in how you run elections uh, in the state and um, and an example of why we need to have federal funding to help states such as Congressman Boyles uh, to be able to to get their system up to speed quickly, um, if not here in 2020, but in 2022. The second, I do want to mention that in Southwest Washington, we have a, a, a you know, strong presence of extremist organizations here uh, that have uh, created a discord, uh, mostly across the river in, in Portland, Oregon. And we've had uh, quite a bit of violence in that community. We've been lucky in Southwest Washington uh, that we haven't had it, but there are certainly um, people who are responding to the president's rhetoric, and that's that's quite alarming. Um, and then just the third point I'll make is one of the things that I've been um, uh, quite saddened to see here in Southwest Washington is a lack of leadership from uh, the current representative to stand up to President Trump uh, and his casting doubt on the outcome of the election, because it's easy for us here as Democrats uh, to criticize the president, but it's the complicity of the Republicans, particularly those who are elected to office, not holding him to account when he is actually casting doubt on the outcome is that's the real problem. Because once they are able to, do, once they are courageous enough to do so, uh, then I think we can be at a turning point where we're moving into a point where we're accepting, I think, the results of the election. So I do think that that is something that I'm hopeful of uh, in terms of Republicans in Congress uh, and uh, and hopeful, of course, for, for a very decisive um, uh, win for Vice President Biden and, and Senator Harris, as well as our own races, so that we don't get to the point uh, that that rhetoric uh, becomes action. Awesome. Thank you so much, Carolyn, Dan, and, and Congressman Boyle. You know, we want to thank you all. Uh, we're grateful for your time and with all the demands they have on your schedule. I'm going to bring on our board co-chair now, Todd Richmond, uh, to say a few final words before we all go off to watch our town hall. Oh, Joel, thank you. Can you hear me, Joel? Great. Joel, thank you so much. And uh, Mark, thank you as well. I do want to say thank you to uh, Hannah and Haley and Hadar, who are on, on, on the call as well. We have really the greatest staff at Democratic Majority for Israel. And I really wanted to say thank you on behalf of myself and my co-chair, Ann Lewis, who is someone who I respect tremendously as well. I wanted to say a quick thank you. Congressman Boyle, um, always good to see a Philly person. Uh, my undergrad was at Westchester University where I specialize in education, everybody. 
uh, where I did my uh, some uh, student experience in inner city Philadelphia. It was a truly rewarding, um, really rewarding experience. And Carolyn and Dan uh, look forward to saying uh, uh, Congress members elect. So we really appreciate you taking the time um, as well. Cool. So once again, my name is Todd Richman. I'm a co-chair of Democratic Majority for Israel. Really want to thank everyone for taking the time today. As you heard from Mark at the top of the call, we are the only organization that's truly fighting to ensure that the Democratic Party remains strongly pro-Israel as it has been for, for decades, but we cannot do this without everybody's support. And um, uh, we appreciate you, you being here tonight. If you care about these issues, uh, please go to dmfi.org and uh, donate to the organization. Uh, sign up for the things that we are doing on Facebook, on Twitter, uh, via email, so you could be a part of our family. Uh, we have done some amazing things in this organization, and we have a lot more to do in the next 20 days. So uh, for our guests tonight, uh, thank you for an incredible conversation. I loved every minute of it. And for uh, our members that are on the call right now, uh, please be on the lookout for our final pre-presidential debate, which is on October. Let me look at the notes that they sent me. Thank you. I'm looking down on October 22nd. Um, so with that, everyone be safe. Uh, hopefully your families are healthy. Uh, Happy New Year for those that celebrate it. And once again, to our congressmen, thank you. To our Congress members elect, good luck. And everybody have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much for joining us.